Okay, so as Ian said, uh, I will be talking about hot pass and cold smells there. Uh, my name is Mateusz Nowak. I'm living uh, in Poland, in Gdańsk, and currently at the role of team manager. Uh, however, I still do have time to write some code. Uh, I'm also a slides writing machine, not only because of my role as a manager, but also due to uh, my interest in giving uh, some talks. I have given one last week and now this one, so uh, quite a lot. Uh, I'm also a regular Reddit CPP leader. You can find a lot of useful information there, especially the comments. Some of them was used to, for preparing this presentation. And I'm also a regular CPCast listener mostly to you to this guy uh, because if you have three months uh, old daughter it's pretty hard to find some interrupted uninterrupted time to, to listen things to carefully also uh, i also uh, apologize if you hear dog barking in the background i try to isolate myself as much as possible but it can still go through A little disclaimer at the beginning uh, that all the views I present are only mine own. A uh, short agenda for those who like it visual and also for those who will be looking at the slides afterwards. Uh, okay. And getting into the talk, uh, what is hot path in code? So this is the frequently executed sequence of instructions. So the things that it's uh done most frequently and it's usually a performance bottleneck and why it's called uh, hot path it's because on in the tools uh this part of code is usually uh marked in red so at the top of list uh, market led red has uh, a thing that takes most of time most of cpu time and uh, why some constructs uh, may smell on hot spots uh, while they're uh, in general uh, okay. So those may in introduce some overhead when used. Uh, they use uh, not optimal algorithm uh, or maybe do some unnecessary things uh, which can be avoided to save this few uh, few milliseconds. Okay, so uh, what I will do next is I will go through some groups of uh, things we can do in C++ and uh, try to, to show some smells uh, when uh, those uh, related to those groups. So first group is uh, of things we can do in C++ is making copies. Uh, so copies are bad for performance uh, because copying takes time and also copying can uh, cause side effects for the others. Uh, let's say we have some object that uh, requires more than half of cache line. Uh, so we have to load this object into the cache, then reserve other cache line for the copy, uh, do a copy, and then uh, flash everything uh, into memory. So uh, in such case, the other cache line in which some other object that will be requ uh, required to use immediately after doing a copy uh, was residing has to be loaded once again. So we waste some, some time on this. However, sometimes copies may be good. Uh, first situation for this is uh, when we can pass a copy through the registry, uh, so for the integers. Uh, if we want to pass an integer to the function as, uh, by refer reference, uh, uh, we will usually see a few assembly instructions for this. Uh, first one, uh, taking an address of the, uh, of the uh, integer value. Uh, putting in it to the registry as a parameter from the function, and then after function is called, uh, the, the, the opposite operation, so uh, getting the value from the address. 
if we pass this integer as uh, as a value, uh, we just copy registry to registry, nothing more. So uh, basically, to assembly instructions. Sorry. Uh, however, also uh, making a copy in multi-threaded applications can be cheaper than holding a lock. Uh, let's imagine the situation when we have uh, some either which is used for storage for objects and we are uh, iterating over objects pulling some objects occasionally from the container and doing some computations based on the value of the object uh, if we uh, we obviously don't want the, this object to be changed when we are doing our computations so uh, if we uh, take a reference to the object we need to hold the lock on the whole container. Other option will be taking a copy and then uh, releasing the lock immediately after making a copy. So if we, if it happens that making a copy is faster, is cheaper than holding a lock for the times of computation, it should be preferred to make a copy. Okay, so if copies smell, uh, or if copies are bad for performance, uh, not having move constructor and move assignment operator will be a smell. So uh, if we have an object and don't define uh, move operations for it, uh, it will be a problem bit because if it will always copy, especially if uh, if uh, copy constructor or copy assignment operator are defined for this object, for the struct or the class, uh, because due to the rules of implicit uh, constructors and uh, assignment operators uh, generation, uh, it happens that if we define copy constructor or copy assignment operator, uh, move constructor or move assignment operator will be implicitly deleted. Uh, here comes rule of in hand rule of zero or rule of five. Uh, I usually prefer the latter one because this way we can do this other thing, which is deleting the copy constructor and copy assignment operator. This way we just delete uh, copying, uh, define uh, move operations uh, as default, and prevent the user from having oppor uh, opportunity or prevent ourselves from having opportunity to make accidentally make a copy. Okay. Uh, why this, uh, why we may want to have such types, we can find some talks like this one from Ivan Kukic uh, from Italian C++ conference this year. Uh, I think the same was given at uh, meeting C++ online uh, meet up this month on last month. Uh, so if you want more details why uh, move only types are preferable, you can watch, for example, this. Stuff. Okay, so uh, to wrap this up, what is the first smell uh, in code? Obviously copies with disclaimer, unless they are absolutely necessary and necessity is uh, driven by measurements. So we should always first profile and check what to do next, if we should optimize copy or not. Okay, the other group of operations we can do in C++ is allocating the memory. So, I would say uh, all allocations smell on hot paths because allocating and allocating memory takes time and it can be a lot. So we have to think how to reduce the impact of the allocations. Uh, first thing we can do is always measure. We can use the tools that are available like hip track. Uh, especially interesting there will be temporary allocations uh, and things for, uh, those are first thing to get rid of. Uh, we can also try to remove allocations uh, totally, or if we cannot do so, try to, to do some other steps like 
using faster allocator than the default one. We have, for example, JE malloc or TC malloc, uh, which, uh, which can replace default malloc. Uh, and uh, from my experience with uh, processing a lot of data, uh, it happens that if I used GE malloc, uh, it gives some nice performance boost, uh, even if LD preloading and completely replacing uh, malloc without uh, watching if it's on hot path or not. And uh, there are already articles that are describing uh, how this, uh, uh, this alternative allocators, uh, how, which uh, you post, how, what boots uh, they could give, like this one for right here. Uh, watching on this diagram, we can see that, uh, for example, TC malloc uh, was measured to to, to be slower in some cases. So again, uh, look at your case, measure performance, and then optimize. The other thing we can do uh, to uh, help on allocating memory, to reduce the impact of allocating memory, is using memory pools. So allocating a large block of memory once, and then use pieces of it uh, for, for, for uh, instead of allocating things. Uh, the examples of memory pools are uh, PMR, which is defined in C++ standard. Uh, unfortunately, it is not well supported by various compilers, but here comes in hand boost container PMR, which is basically the same as to PMR, uh, and just simply works by uh, making a dependency on boost. Uh, from some specific applications, uh, we can see in TensorFlow, there is a best fit coalescing allocator, uh, which is uh, which can be configured to work as a memory pool with fixed size. It's one of the options there. Okay, so doing some measurements, how the using memory pool uh, is making us to work faster. I, took an example of Vector uh, with two different versions, one standard one and the other with PMR, uh, boost PMR, and a test that is adding 4,000 integers to the Vector. Uh, vector has this property that it uh, grows from time to time and copy all the elements uh, when pushing back things to it. So here, the four tests were done. As I said, two different containers, uh, or maybe two containers diff using different allocation strategies, one default allocator, allocator and the other and, uh, synchronized pool resource from PMR, and two other tests, which one is simply pushing back elements and the other is uh, reserving the memory in advance for the vector. So in this case, it happens that uh, using uh, memory pool and uh, reserving uh, vectors memory in advance gives more or less the same performance. However, still, if we combine the pool and the reserve, uh, the, the performance is uh, much bigger, especially when comparing to a simple pushback. So to wrap this up, we can say that unnecessary memory allocations smell on hot pass. The other group of things we can use in C++ are containers. Uh, there are a bunch of them. We have lists, uh, which uh, most important property of it is it, it is not having continuous underlying uh, memory buffer. We have vector with uh, continuous uh, buffer. We have DQ, which is basically uh, group of linked uh, smaller buffers uh, and we have array which uh, has size given in uh, compile time and uh, imp important property here is that uh, you never add elements to the array you just replace uh, already things that are already there. Uh, so from different experiences different projects uh, in most cases uh, 
the intuition is to have uh, performance activities like this. So the RI being most performant because you don't add elements to it, you just usually have a fixed list of elements. Uh, then the queue, because adding element there is faster uh, than vector and then list being the slower. Uh, we can find different benchmarks uh, over the internet, like this one, comparing those containers. Uh, you can see there that this equation may not be always uh, true for different parameters. Uh, so again, measure before you change, check which option is uh, best for you. Uh, make a profile of friends, so either uh, perf, which is available in Linux, or uh, something proprietary like Vitium, uh, is your best friend here. Uh, also, apart from measuring, uh, we have to remember some superpowers of the different containers for, for the list. Uh, the superpowers are Inserting and erasing elements in constant time, assuming that we have iterator to the place when we where we want to add or where we want to remove in advance. Uh, and also the other thing is for list iterators are never invalidated, so we can uh, re uh, rearrange elements, move them between different lists, and still uh, have a stable iterator. Uh, from the other places. Like, let's say we have some map with string keys and the iterators are va uh, as values and then some list uh, containing the objects. So it will work well without problems because the iterators won't change. Uh, the superpowers for vector, is so obviously it can grow uh, during runtime and also that we can reserve space for the vector in advance. So if we know how many elements there will be added uh, to this vector, we can just uh, construct it and then reserve space. Okay, moving from sequential containers to the associative ones, we have a map uh, with uh, logarithmic uh, operation time, and we have unordered map uh, with average constant uh, operations time. Uh, I made a small comparison between them. I don't think it will be surprising that an order map is uh, much faster for insertion, insertions and a little bit faster for lookups uh, than uh, map, well, than standard map. Uh, so, uh, it should be obvious that if we see a usage of standard map, stood map on, uh, on hot path, we should look for a way to replace it. However, uh, again, map has some superpowers uh, that uh, invalidate the assumption for the unordered map to be used by default. So if in the map, elements are sorted by key, which gives uh, stable iteration order, order uh, and also gives ability to look for the next element with key greater or key less than uh, the value we are looking for. Another thing for maps uh, is uh, usage of uh, index operator and uh, add function. Uh, it was mentioned in the, or described in not so long ago in C++ Weekly, episode 234. Uh, that uh, index operator is doing much more work than add function because it is always trying to insert new element uh, before returning a reference that and can be replaced if we, for example, are trying to put something new in the map. Uh, so it won't be surprising here, uh, looking at this screen from, the, from this episode, that using add function gives some performance boost. Uh, 
So if you see a map, an order, an ordered map with index operator, the red flag should be raised that uh, probably you should replace uh, the way elements are looked at, uh, look up in the map. The other thing with maps, uh, this is the third one, uh, is uh, that uh, we have some alternatives. And basically, I will talk about two options. The uh, first one is, is using third party implementations or maybe homegrown ones. Uh, and the other one is using std array instead of a map. Here, uh, I'll show how, how the comparison between uh, student map and uh, fathash map from upsale. Uh, and it happens that using this flat map, uh, flat hash map uh, is giving quite nice speed up uh, when adding and uh, looking for the elements. Uh, it's taking adv advantage of uh, data locality, making uh, larger buf buffers instead of allocating uh, single objects. So here, uh, if we look at this again, uh, as it was uh, when we were comparing uh, std map with std and order map, uh, speed up for the insertion is much greater than speed up for the lookup. But again, it is a lot uh, and uh, can save some, uh, some uh, precious milliseconds when we are on the hot path. The other thing uh, I will show is, again, <laughs> referencing the C++ Wiki uh, episode, this time number 233, uh, is replacing the map with stud-array, which is const exp. So the idea here is uh, that if we have uh, string keys that are known in advance at compile time, uh, the compiler, if using uh, std array with std find function, can generate uh, pretty optimized uh, lookup code for, for each string value. Looking at the performance benchmark uh, that was shown in this episode, uh, we can see that uh, context array uh, with std find is much, much faster than uh, stood map in this case, uh, and also if we would compare uh, the same with unordered map, we would see uh, also much uh, great, much uh, greater performance. Uh, I did the experiment uh, with this technique, uh, having a map uh, of uh, around sixty elements, sixty different strings. Uh, 60 different string keys, uh, and uh, as it uh, was done in C++11 mode, uh, when I could uh, use only std string because string view is not available there, and uh, make uh, the map this array only const because uh, in this C++11 mode, uh, std string uh, in const x mode wasn't compiling. Uh, there was a nice speed up scene. So not only as here we have, uh, I think, 10 different strings or eight different strings, but uh, with much bigger number of strings. If we use const array, we can have better performance that, uh, than uh, const uh, map. Okay, so uh, to wrap up uh, containers, uh, there's some I have some intuition about using the containers. So if I need associative container, uh, I, I would first check if I can go with an array, if, if all this, the keys are known in the compile time, then I would try to use a third party map. And only absolutely if I cannot use the third party library, uh, I would go with the standard map because of performance. 
and only uh, and also the obvious thing uh, first go with unordered so hash and then uh, use uh, ordered versions source to the map and only if you need order of ele between elements for non associative containers uh, first choice would be an array uh, then if we uh, need a continuous buffer or know the size of the buffer in advance uh, we go with vector uh, otherwise we use stood the queue because inserting to it and removing elements at the beginning and the end is much faster and in the end we use stood list uh, oh, i think uh, not fit, not using the one uh, which fits best for the case use, but uh, otherwise using uh, uh, something that we type at first without thinking, double thinking what we will need. Okay, so uh, the other group of uh, things that we can do. The other camera works. Okay. Uh, the other thing of uh, the other group of things that we can do is using strings, uh, which are slow. I won't dig into the obvious uh, because we, I think, all, all know that that appending, uh, concatenating, and doing anything with strings is slow. I will show uh, one example of using string which is using string as enum and why it shouldn't be used and how it can be replaced possibly so let's say we have some library that is uh, uh, returning on accepting uh, strings from known pool like uh, message types from some communication library uh, it is tempting to simply use uh, the string in our uh, interfacing that wrap this library. Uh, so if we have uh, some API, some which uh, allows to pass a message uh, with a string uh, type in this case, uh, and want to do some handling based on this uh, library we can end up with code like this so have some map uh, which keys are message types and then uh, values are pointers to message handling functions uh, i could obviously use the technique that i show earlier with the array of strings uh, however uh, the end result still won't be as good as the thing I will show in a minute. So instead of using uh, the string keys, we can obviously uh, use just enum for this. And uh, uh, it makes uh, the, our interfaces look more or less the same. It's just passing an enum instead of string. We can easily recover the string because we can have some container that uh, uh, contains those strings, which is indexed by the enum values. And it happens that if we do such simple benchmark as this, uh, uh, just calling the process function for a thousand times uh, with different messages uh, inversion with string enums and inversion with uh, stand normal enums the performance difference here is huge in this case it is around if i remember the exact value correctly it's around uh, 270,000 times faster when using uh, just enum instead of string So to wrap this up, this short section, uh, we can say that misusing strings is, is bad for hot pass and smells them. The other thing uh, that may be problematic on hot pass is shared pointer. 
uh, quick recap what, what are smart pointers. Uh, so those are constructs from since C11 that wrap pointers and are able to show on ownership and uh, automatically destroy the, the results uh, when going out of owner scope. So we have a unique pointer for unique ownership and shared pointer for shared ownership, and then weak pointer, which is not owning pointer to shared pointer. So passing shared pointer has some cost because shared pointer is not a pointer, it's an uh, object which has a copy and move operations defined. And passing it by value uh, results in a copy, or may result in a copy, uh, assuming the compiler won't do optimization on it. Uh, and the copying uh, has to always uh, take a look, uh, then check if shared pointer is containing anything, and in such case, increase reference count under a lock. So let's uh, look at uh, some screens from Compile Explorer. Uh, the links are below the images. Uh, so if we have this simple case, we have some functions that uh, function that's accepting shared pointer and passing it further, in this case, by value. It is resulting in 106 uh, lines of assembly because of this locking and uh, increasing uh, uh, use count. When we replace this with uh, passing shred pointer bar reference, it is squeezed into a single assembly line, just a jump. So a lot of time saved. In this case, uh, when the function, when we don't transfer ownership to the, to the function we call, uh, we are safe that to, to pass uh, shared pointer in this way. The other thing when, uh, which we can do is uh, passing uh, R-value reference or moving shared pointer. Again, uh, it's a, a single jump in this case. When we are returning, okay, so not returning. Uh, the other option passing uh, just simply a pointer is kind of shared pointer. Uh, here we have two instructions because we need to pull the, the pointer out of the shared pointer. And also in this case, we assume that, uh, we probably will assume that uh, this uh, shared pointer will contain some something valid instead of no pointer. Uh, yeah, uh, the thing that we have to remember on hot paths is uh, that uh, Defensive checks cost time, and uh, uh, we need to make some assumptions or not to do to, too much defensive checks and delegate them to upper levels. Do it once somewhere. There you go. Okay. Packing of track with shared pointers. If we want to return shared pointer bar value, it's again uh, some assembly code. In this case, uh, initialization of this static uh, shot pointer and returning it by value results in 66 lines of assembly code. If we return shot pointer by reference, uh, we say 40 lines of assembly. So this translates to a lot of time. Uh, I was doing a profiling once on application when the returning a shared pointer was uh, the main offender uh, in perf and was taking like just like fifteen percent of CPU time for this case. Uh, when if returning reference completely gets rid of this time. Okay. Uh, we can also return, uh, instead of returning shared pointer, we just can just return the pointer and it's again the same amount of lines that, uh, that if returning a shared reference to shared pointer. So uh, I would propose some rules uh, for uh, passing shared pointers. Uh, the first one is when transferring ownership or sharing ownership, uh, return or pass by value because it will mark uh, ownership transfer uh, explicit. 
uh, or pass by R value reference if we don't uh, get the right point after the, 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 the call to the function after pass. If we don't transfer ownership, we can return uh, reference to shared pointer or just return reference to object or just return row pointer to object. It will be much faster than uh, returning shared pointer. Uh, or we can, the other way, pass reference to shared pointer or pass simply reference to object containing shared pointer or pass row pointer inside of shared pointer. However, in this case, we need to remember that uh, we can easily shoot or either result into the foot or shoot ourselves into the foot. Uh, because uh, if we don't return shot pointer by value, it, it's not as safe. Uh, in this case, I would say if seeing shot pointer on the hot path, I would double check if I cannot use unique pointer there. Uh, in some cases, uh, shared pointer can be replaced with unique pointer. And again, uh, what I'm repeating all the time, compiler is able to optimize different things. So you need to run profiling for the case to check if uh, the change is really viable. To wrap this up, I would say overused shared pointer is a hotspot smell. Okay, uh, next group of things that we can do in C++ is evaluating things, and uh, especially evaluating things unnecessary. So stating in expressions which results will be unused, which will be discarded, uh, which I will show example in a minute. So here we have a logging function. We don't always uh, want to have logging that is uh, disabled by compiled time fact. We uh, sometimes want logging that can be com configured at runtime. So here this, uh, this logging function is accepting clock level and then formatting string and then arguments. Uh, so if we simply call this function, in this case, in a very bad way. Uh, here we first construct the formatting string, form, construct all the arguments, then uh, doing formatting and return the string, formatted string, and only then passing it uh, to the log function, which if logging is disabled or set on a row level, which the string will be disabled. So we lost a uh, lot of time doing uh, basically nothing use, useful. Still bad situation when we uh, properly pass arguments to the log function. Here, the formatting string will be constructed, all the arguments will be constructed, uh, passed to the logging function, and then discarded if logging is disabled. Still sometimes wasted. How to resolve this? We can use thing called lazy evaluation. So uh, try to make things in the way that we result in evaluating uh, all the statements only when there are needed. First way to do this is uh, pretty simple. It's using a macro that uh, just wraps uh, the call to the uh, function in a, in a if statement. Uh, here, uh, we just check if logging is enabled for the level we want. Uh, mark it as unlikely because usually we don't want uh, uh, logging. And uh, we can hint the compiler here that this path in the code uh, won't be necessarily often used. So we can for example, move it later and do some optimizations that uh, will affect uh, instruction cache for this function. Uh, yeah, so in this case, uh, it is also then easy to use uh, because we just search and replace the call to the function with the, the call to the macro. Uh, so 
people may say uh, we shouldn't use macros in C++, but there are cases that it is useful, especially because if we go with a C++ way of doing things, so instead of passing parameters to the function, we, we can pass a lambda uh, that will be called later uh, and will create the, the, the uh, formatting string and the arguments. It is much more complicated. So we have a wrapping lock function, which is a templated function uh, accepting uh, lambda. And then if log level is enabled, uh, which is unlikely, uh, we apply the parameters uh, constructed by the tuple, uh, by the lambda to the uh, very, to the end logging function. Uh, here, we cannot simply, this log func, this end logging function cannot be a function because uh, stood apply record, don't, doesn't allow to, to, to uh, be applied on template functions. So this is kind of workaround using a struct with call operator, with templated call operator to make it a compiler at all. Okay. So to wrap this section up, I would say a necessary evaluation is as well on hot path. So if you see this, you have to think how to get rid of it. Then uh, some missing and unnecessary keywords that are available in the language can have some impact of performance. The compiler is able to do different optimizations uh, like constant folding, inlining, evaluating things at uh, compile time. And also things that are uh, defined in the standard uh, since C17 required to do by the compiler. So copulation or return value optimizations or named return value optimizations. Uh, we can easily prevent this by uh, forgetting about keywords and using unnecessary keywords. And we can also help the compiler to do these optimizations. What we can do to do so? Uh, first thing is the using const whenever possible. So the constant folding may happen. Uh, or even better, uh, using context whenever possible. So compiler can uh, possibly evaluate things on compiler time. Or even better, use const eval whenever possible to force the compiler to like compute things on compile time. Uh, yes, this can uh, slow down compilation, but on the other case, if we are looking for runtime performance, it's, uh, it's a cost that we want to take. We can also get rid of unnecessary private member functions because uh, private member functions uh, cannot be easily optimized. Uh, not not all, always can be in line. Uh, Etc. And uh, we would like to move these private functions to the freestanding functions that are a translation unit local. And we also want to mark all translation unit local function static or put them in anonymous namespace to tell the compiler that it can safely inline things and get rid of them. Uh, as separate entities. And also, uh, we don't want to use uh, std move unless it is absolutely necessary because using std move can prevent uh, optimizations like uh, LVO on L or an LVO. Uh, and with these keywords, with doing this uh, tools that I think Victor was talking about today earlier, like Silang ID can help a lot. So we can put them, for example, in our CI and uh, make them prevent uh, accepting code that is uh, uh, using unnecessary and, uh, or missing carrots. 
the other important keyword that shouldn't be missed is no accept. Uh, but in the case when we have uh, different uh, constructors and assignment operators on the class. Again, reference to the C++ weekly, uh, which is showing an example of vector of some struct uh, and uh, behavior uh, that if no except uh, keyword is missing, uh, the vector on growing is using uh, uh, copy uh, constructor and if move constructor is marked as no except, it is moving. Uh, it is using move constructor instead, instead so saving some time on uh, growing. However, and there's a talk from C++ on C last year from Niels Decker. Blindly tap, typing no except everywhere can be harmful for performance. And there he lists some situations uh, where adding no exact keyword was uh, making things perform worse, uh, which is for inline functions and then uh, for exported library functions, at least the, the latter one, at least in case of Visual Studio Compiler. So yeah, don't blindly type uh, keywords, uh, know what you are doing and again measure what is happening in your code before making a decision uh, that you want to optimize something and how to optimize this thing so again hot pass smell forgetting or blindly, blindly typing keywords so getting to the end of the talk uh, i would do a short rock up on smells that i was talking about and I mentioned earlier. So first of all, copies. Again, unless uh, it happens that copies is uh, co copying is better than not copying. Uh, doing unnecessary memory allocations because allocating takes a lot of time. Misusing containers, and then misusing or using at all strings. Overusing short pointer evaluating things uh, unnecessary, and then blindly typing or forgetting uh, keywords, which may affect uh, how compiler is generating things. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you all for, for your attention. Uh, I appreciate every feedback. You can do this uh, by contacting me either on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Uh, and also on GitHub, you can find uh, benchmarks with, which I did for this talk, as well as slides uh, for this talk and for the other talks I gave in the past. And again, thank you very much. That is all.